both sides now. Um, all right, and um, for as far as I'm concerned, we're live. And okay, so hi, hi Douglas, well, uh, welcome to the show. Um, it is it is Saturday the 11th of March, and mm. welcome to the show. We, we're going to talk today about super soldiers and the Nazi connection to super soldiers, which I think will be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, dear lady. <laughs> <laughs> so um, hopefully my sound is, is clear. I'm not sure. I haven't got a plug in mic. Am I loud and clear? You are loud and clear. I hear you loudly and clearly. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. So um, as the listener m might not know, I, um, I started life in an orphanage. It was a Catholic run orphanage and um, I was adopted age four, four and a half, uh, to a family, the Hart family, and they uh, brought me to Hayes. And I had uh, an adoptive brother who was a couple of years older. They, my father had uh, a sister who was a nun, Sister Kathleen Hart of the Daughters of St. Paul, and they were abusive. He was, he took me off to Dublin, was sexually abusive to me um my mother was violent she used to whip me with a cane on the backs of my legs leaving you know um horrible marks i still haven't really got over um and then <clears throat> at age 13 i ran away from home and they were supposed to come and get me from my friend's house i was only stayed out one night and they instead of them coming a social worker came and put me into care and so then I spent from 13 to 18 in care. Um, I was taken out of care and there was a worker there whose whose father had a detective agency. So quite a few of us went to uh, be interviewed. Uh, we had to apply properly. I'd been through a grammar school and so I was taken on. So I worked for a detective agency when I was younger. <laughs> and we did stuff like finding people, surveillance, that kind of thing. Uh, and I left it for a while because I didn't really much like it. And then I went back again, worked for ex-CID officers. And then everybody wanted to work for the spooks in London. Everybody wanted to work for the ex-MI5, ex-MI6 agency. So I moved up to working for them. And then um, I, I was very interested in the serial killer Ian Brady when I was younger and um, Ian Brady is a serial killer over here he killed I think five victims and um, he had then invited me to come and see him I had come to see him and the press found out so the press made me a front page story and they said that he was my long lost father and I claimed it so it was like this front page Brady is my father but I hadn't claimed it. They basically got me in a hotel room, a guy called Phil Hall, and said to me, you can be some stupid slut who's interested in serial killers, or you can be his daughter. So I chose daughter. But it, in effect, ruined my life. Um, I went off to America. I started to work as a tabloid hack. But he had trained me. And then when I came back from America, I um, started to work as a journalist. And then I quickly started to work in defence and they sent me over to Northern Ireland, Belfast. And that's where I had the relationship with Liam Campbell, who's a real IRA commander. And um, soon I worked with the BBC out there, John Ware. I didn't work with him, but I certainly encountered him a lot. He was out there trying to finish off the real IRA um, but I suspect that my intelligence led to the real IRA collapsing um, I literally went in houses and bars and had this you know sexual relationship um, with one of their commanders and um, so then I came back um, I also became interested in a second serial killer America's Hill, um, Kenneth Bianchi I went to visit him and I did wonder when I was writing to him what I was doing because I seemed to have a part of me that was writing to him that seemed disconnected from the rest, although it was certainly aware of the rest. 
And then I record that in um, in South Armagh, the real IRA commander I had the relationship with said that I was two people, that I was one who was moody, depressed, and the other that was exciting. And um, so I first became aware of this. Then I wrote a book called In for the Kill, which was my second published book about my life story. And somebody contacted me who was a friend of Fritz Springmeier, and she said, you a MK Ultra mind control victim. And I'd never heard of that, and it all seemed all very American and way out, and I thought, oh, that's crazy stuff. Uh, but she put me in a group with other women who had apparently been under this, and there was a girl called Louise, and I said I'd always wanted to have, I'd have therapy for years, but I always wanted to get at my sexual abuse because I, I felt like it was stuck in my head, and I didn't know myself, and I felt if I could just get at the really sort of hardcore stuff, not that I wanted to, but, you know, just to cough it out. And I said, you know, I'd been everywhere, including the Priory, trying to reach it. And she said, well, what do you see when you try? And I said, this is just a block. It's like a brick wall. And she said, has the brick wall got anything on it? And I said, yeah, yeah, it's easy. Donald Duck, Disney. And she said, that's classic Disneyland programming and I remember feeling a cold sense of fear and um, I um, thought I I'll google that and I didn't want to I hope nothing would come up but I put in Disneyland mind control and loads of stuff came up which I was horrified by and then I remembered that my parents had sent me to the convent age 12 just before I got put back in care and I got put in the dormitory in Boston the daughters of St Paul I've got a convert in Boston and um, it was kind of weird when I was there, actually. Um, they then she then took me to Disney World, um, which was weird. But I just thought, oh, my parents been nice to me um, right. for once. You know, I get to see Disney World. Yeah. So I said, well, Disney World is involved in my life because I was taken there by by my aunt, you know, as a treat, I thought. But then I was swiftly put back on the plane I thought I was going to stay in the convert and be a sister but they were like no 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 you like the Beatles don't you and uh, if you like the Beatles George Harrison you can't be a nun which is kind of looking back that is um it's just an excuse but at the time I believed it um that you know I had a crush on George Harrison you can't be a nun so um I, I accepted that um you know and um so I then started to believe that this this woman might be right and so I was googling it and I looked up mind control found James Casbolt actually and found Miles Johnson and I listened to Casbolt and it was weird as I listened to Casbolt I felt a pressure on the front of my head like where the third eye is and it felt like I would I had fallen and it sort of rebounded like a kind of bang on my forehead and then I had this vision of waking up and I was in a boxing ring and there was a other guy there who I'd been fighting and he helped me out and he said you all right you're taking a hard bang to your forehead and he took me to the table and I was eating and I was eating awful pig awful and I spat it out I said this isn't meat and he said shut up or they'll um think that fall did something to your head and I looked up and there was all these um, Nazis. And I turned to the guy and I said, not being funny, where am I? And he said, you, you, you've you taken that, that head injury has affected you. He said, Treblinka. And um, that was the first recall I had of that. The second recall was being in a place called Velversburg Castle. And um, there was a... Oh, no, it was another recall. The other recall was I was waiting with my sister Clara and I found out what my name was. It was Hans and my sister was called Clara. We were waiting outside an office. We went in and there was a, a German guy with steel glasses on and he was sticking needles into my cheek. And I was very, very scared. We had to have this done weekly. And my sister Clara said, don't be afraid, just call on angels. But I was really afraid of this needle in my cheek. Um, and then she came out one time under a stretcher and she was dead, which horrified me. Then I went on to work in Treblinka 
I became a boxer there. And then they moved me to Welversburg. And what happened, they opened a portal one day in a room and this being came through and it had really bright white light. And the being was showing each of us in the room something that we really cared about. And it showed me Clara and Clara was somewhere and she was playing. She was OK. And I fell to my knees. And as I fell to my knees to worship this being, whatever it was, suddenly all the lights went out, just everything went dark. Um, and then I started trying to research that. That was when I came across. It was in the group. This woman, Anna, she posted this picture of this. Michael Aquino chap and she said he had begun these projects so I thought well I'll interview him and find out about was he involved with the Crusader rescue where you know my orphanage and it was very strange that they used to every six months we had to go back to the orphanage and I always remember we had to line up for jelly and ice cream and, and it I don't remember anything else but jelly and ice cream and I remember a woman there called Valerie she had steel rim glasses too. And I remember ringing, it's now changed to the Catholic Children's Society. I rang them up, I said, I want to trace Valerie. She was there, blah, blah, blah. And they said, no, 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 we only had the clergy looking after the kids. I said, no, 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 I remember her. They denied her existence. I actually have a photograph of her. My mother had it, so, but they still denied that she worked there. Um, even though the orphanage is clearly in the background. Um, they said, oh, it must have been one of the mothers and you got confused. No, I didn't. Um, and so I tracked down Michael Aquino, said, did you ever work for the Crusades of Rescue? He then, um, he didn't answer me. And then that night I had that experience of, um, he appeared to me as a bunny rabbit. I, I saw, I was trying to go to sleep suddenly a bunny rabbit appeared and it was really close and there was a pink nose it was it's little red eyes it was disgusting and I thought because I don't really like rabbits so I went and like put cold water on my face went back to bed tried to sleep next thing the bunny rabbit was back um next thing the bunny rabbit really ran across a field and this girl, Louise, in the group, she'd been telling me to write little notebooks with, she said, you've probably got a few different parts. Get four notebooks and then use them and write about these different parts. And there was one part and it was covered in ice and I couldn't reach it. And so I brought this ice part, a purple notebook. The only thing I wrote in it was the words Project Aquino and um, put that down. Anyway, this rabbit went really fast and the part of me that was covered in ice lifted out of my body and went after him. I didn't have any control over it. Went really fast and then suddenly went downwards, um, down a rabbit hole, I'm guessing. Um, I hit the bottom. I was then fully conscious, even though laying on the bed, I was fully conscious. I was down the rabbit hole and I was facing um, what I knew to be my Aquino, I'd seen photos of him and he said, what do you want? And I said, oh, an interview with you about the Crusades of Rescue. I was told that I was a mind control victim. I want to find out whether I was or I wasn't. And he said, no, no, no. I mean, what do you really want? And I said, oh, in life or love, I suppose. And he said, follow me. And I went down this corridor, came to the end. And as I looked out, it was like seeing the universe. There's lots of stars. And he said, I'll give you the power to go into anyone's mind throughout history, like anybody. And I remember thinking of Henry VIII and now I'd like to see what he was up to. And he said, all you have to do is get into this. And it was what I know now as a Merkaba. And um, I looked at it and I didn't want to climb into it. And I said to him, this isn't right. What about Jesus? And as soon as I said Jesus, I found myself clicked back into my body. Um, and I told a friend um, straight away on Facebook and he said, oh, that was your first interview with him. He's a black magician. Um, you shouldn't have emailed him. So I was like curious. So I emailed this Aquino guy back and I said, I told him the whole vision. And then he sent me a link to the to the song, um, Alice in Wonderland song by Jefferson Airplane. Yes, Jefferson. Yes. Yeah, he sent me that. And he said, we'll have to get the lyrics changed now um, to incorporate our little adventure together. 
So that happened. And then I tracked you down. And then you told me quite a lot about mind control. And you said it was controlled off planet. And me seeing the serial killers was linked with that. And I didn't really understand a lot of what you were saying. But then over the years, I've learned and grown. I mean, it started off, I gave interviews to, with um, Miles Johnson. I got to know Max Spears. He came on my radio show that you got me with Revolution Radio. He ended up murdered. Um, I was supposed to go to the conference with Miles. I ended up not going. Every time I was going to go to meet Miles, I got a warning, a really strong psychic warning not to go. And yeah. um, so that, that that has happened to me now. A, a lot has happened since. Like I've, um, the Sienna Miller, the actress Sienna Miller has um, been talking about me online saying I rang her GP. I'm involved with a, um, a court case now, the Daily Mail versus Doreen Lawrence. So my name is pretty much being crucified and ruined. Um, I still don't know much about this Nazi connection, but Max Spears girlfriend, um, uh, sorry, fiance, um, Sarah R. Adams. And people say, oh, she wasn't going out with him at the time he was murdered. But he told me only a few days before he was murdered that he was madly in love with her. So um, I think they had a like on off thing, but they were definitely pretty tightly bound. Um, and he. Um, he, you know, was talking to me about the Nazis, um, and then she, uh, Sarah, has a group that meets regularly, and she invited me, and she works with ET, maybe to all whites, and she called down the ET, and one of them appeared in my mind, and I said, I need to know what was going on with the mind control, what's the link with the Nazis, because I feel it's relevant today, and she said, um, I'm sorry, this this being appeared with really glowing green eyes and long white hair. And he said, I'm from Alderbaran. And I know Alderbaran has a link with the Nazis. And I know James Casbolt talked about that. I mean, I did exchange letters with him when he was in prison, but he really didn't say anything. And of course now, because he, what, he, what he did, he's kind of not, you can't engage with him. Um, I don't think he'd say anything anyway. I think pretty much prison destroyed him and um, Max Spears is gone and it's almost like the whole thing has been shut down. Um, what's your thoughts, Douglas, on all of that? Oh, oh with too many too to many count. Many I mean, count. I'll, I'll try and outline this as best as I can and uh, we'll, we'll go along with it and, of course, we'll uh, uh, basically address uh, whatever questions arise as I try to address uh, the entire amalgamation of uh -huh. experiences that have done so much to impact your life, which of course has been tragic and full of challenges. And uh, the reason that uh, your life is important is because you've accomplished so much uh, yet have been given very little credit. It's uh, something that is um, uh, just offensive by the fact that uh, you've uh, merited uh, much better than you've received. And uh, the entire uh, situation begins with your victimization as a child. So I want you to know that uh, you've been struggling against something that's so monumental that it's been uh, miraculous that you've overcome what you have to the degree that you have. We're still working on overcoming um, uh, so much more. And uh, this is the tragedy of the uh, so-called super soldier. So uh, the very term, of course, is something that is uh, profoundly misleading. Uh, and really the more appropriate term for so many uh, so-called super soldiers would be super victim. And uh, this is what many of them are. And um, in reality, one of the individuals you bring up, James Casbolt, is certainly a super victim. But uh, just because someone's a victim, 
doesn't mean that they are a nice person. Uh, certainly, he's institutionalized and he's right where he belongs based on uh, experiences that anyone who's dealt with him uh, will verify. Uh, I'll go a bit into that, of course, and I do want to say your other friend who has uh, tried to help you in her own right, uh, I'm presuming the best, I'm assuming the best, uh, Sarah Rachel Adams, her very initials, SRA, uh, satanic ritual abuse. The very uh, three words that comprise satanic ritual abuse, well, the first three letters, Sarah Rachel Adams. Uh, this is something that she's a product of uh, that has uh, led to her um, being what she is. And she's still very much involved in that matrix because she's very much sponsored. Um, she travels all over the world, uh, does essentially what she wants to do, um, did wind up, I believe, not that I've been following her life with any degree of uh, dedication, but she finally wound up pairing up with some individual, at least for a while, that seemed steady, and this is after Max Spears. Uh, and that brings us back to Max Spears. Now, these are three profoundly, intimately, intricately involved characters, uh, and they are people who I personally knew. Um, Sarah Rachel Adams, of course, is uh, profoundly upset with myself. Uh, and uh, has vocalized that. Um, so everything I'm going to say, I do want people to understand, is not something based on uh, personal assumptions or presumptions. I mean, this is a matter of open and public record. Uh, Sarah Rachel Adams has gone on the record with her um, uh, dissatisfaction with me, uh, to put it mildly, and uh, she's expressed this in uh, very, well, some would say defamatory or slanderous terms. Uh, I feel it's so outrageous, her claims, that, I, it, that, that they can't be taken seriously. However, um, concerning myself, uh, but uh, when it comes to someone like Max Spears, then we're walking in more delicate territory. Um, the one thing that I was always supportive of for years was Sarah Rachel Adams, and uh, the one thing that I stood up for her uh, concerning uh, her accomplishments in life was, uh, among what other uh, accomplishments she has, I've always stood by the fact that she saved Max Spears's life for a, a long period of time. And uh, without her, he would have been dead much sooner. Uh, ultimately, however, uh you're all victims uh in to a degree of miles johnston and miles johnston is was while aquino was alive and aquino is still alive in a very real sense not just in terms of his legacy uh but in terms of uh very much um taking possession of certain people, certainly uh, people that I had the misfortune of working with, who were proud to take on uh, possession by Michael Aquino, uh, bragging about it. Uh, and uh, I'll go into that as well, where you go, again, the, the story is involved, the narrative goes back into history, it does go back to the Third Reich, uh, and this is why um, Christine Joanna Hart uh, sought myself out. Uh, knowing that I would be able to provide at least some context. So um, again, in providing what context I can, starting with the personal, uh, I want people to know that uh, uh, Max Spears uh, was victimized to death by Michael Aquino and Miles Johnston. And what Miles Johnston was serving as was a handler for many super soldiers. This includes Max Spears, James Casbolt, alias Michael Prince, uh, and uh, ultimately uh, Christine Joanna Hart among them. Uh, Miles Johnston uh, is ruthless uh, and yet at the same time oblivious. He's no mastermind, but he was indeed working with a mastermind, Michael Angelo Aquino. So all of this is connected, and uh, it uh, brings us back to the Reich, the Presidio, everything that happened there, my work with Michael Aquino, uh, and ultimately uh, so many victims. 
uh, this this trail of if not bodies, then souls, psyches, oh. shattered. Could, psyches. could you go into the the Nazi connection and why is there a Nazi connection? <laughs> The Nazi connection has to deal with your genetic origins. You are um, a product of the Lebensborn program. Lebensborn is the German word for uh, Lebens, means life, born, obviously, birth. Uh, it, it may sound redundant, like born of life, but it's really a poetic metaphor, fountains of life. So the fountains of life uh, was uh, Heinrich Himmler's attempt to maintain a European identity. Now, the important thing to realize is that uh, Heinrich Himmler understood that appearance and identity are profoundly linked. Uh, the two world wars uh, shattered uh, the Caucasian ethnos. Um, just so people understand the profundity of this, uh, the crisis that has led to the backlash of white supremacy, which is not in and of itself uh, wrong or evil. Rather, it's been misguided because of this horrific uh, perversion and uh, the uh, implication of male supremacy, which has become very much intertwined with this, this ideology. Uh, understand, of course, there were evil aspects to a concept of white supremacy before World War II. These were manifested not by the Nazis, but by the communists. And uh, the qualification needs to be put out there before I get back to Liebensborn, because Liebensborn obviously is uh, very much concerned with breeding a certain kind of genotype, which is blonde, blue-eyed, uh, Nordic Aryan. Uh, understand that uh, before the war, one of the things brought up in my book, The Roswell Deception, which I must promote simply because it's required reading. Uh, it is what I consider like a basic book, not simply because it's fundamental to your understanding of the reality that you've been denied in terms of history. And I speak to this to all our listeners and viewers, uh, but rather it's uh, so profoundly simple uh, compared to the way I would have written it, this is thanks to, and I mean this in the positive sense, uh, this is thanks to my co-author Peter Moon rendering it legible and accessible to the reading public. Uh, so it's a general introduction. Um, go there as a source, you'll find out the basics uh, for which to have a better understanding, ask more intelligent questions, you will have the context, the real narrative that you've been denied. So one of the things that we bring up in there that's pivotal, that's important uh, to World War II from the Japanese perspective as outlined in that book is just as important to the European perspective. It's, uh, it's important to the world. And this is the fact that uh, Jack London, who lived right here in the greater San Francisco Bay Area metroplex region from which I'm talking to you right now, Jack London was one of America's most famous authors, one of the few that they had uh, to pit against and consider a part of their formulation of an American identity uh, in comparison to the Europeans across the Atlantic. So this man uh, is essentially an adventure tale teller. And at the same time, uh, he's required reading in American schools. Uh, the overwhelming majority of American children for generations grew up reading Jack London. And Jack London was very much a rabid communist. He was an ideological communist who was fanatical to the point on the level of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, who are responsible for one of proportionately uh, the largest genocide in history, 
where they wiped out half their own population, destroyed literally the equivalent of somebody in the, it would be as if everybody in the United States with a firearm went out and killed their neighbor uh, and half the is, American is, population. Is this, is this, uh, this is an Aryans that, that died, no? No, no, they were re- ethnic supremacists in the basis of their ideology of the Khmer. But the reason right. that they're important is that as an example of uh-huh. how far Jack London was willing to go because Jack London wanted to do that on behalf of the white races of Earth. So oh, think, Jack London. But do, yeah. do, 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 do you know what's happening in the UK now? We, we've been swamped by by migrants or, you know, they stay in boats, but I think, you know, it's been going on a long time. And there's no right wing groups here. They've all been pretty much wiped out. We're not allowed to say certain things, which I think, you know, I think it's wrong, really. You know, I mean, I actually prefer sometimes, you know, foreign people, certainly white people haven't done anything nice to me. I was sexually abused and beaten. Um, so I really care. But I do believe that certain countries should have an identity and, and a race and not just be swamped by a different race. Which Absolutely. Is- Absolutely. This is something that uh, understand, as I've said before, that racism is intrinsically in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with it. And the first thing I need to emphasize is we are all racist. It's a redundant survival mechanism. It is there because we uh, obviously evolved uh, to uh, fit our environments. And this is why we have people with darker shades of melanin in more tropical regions where there's more exposure to sunlight and white people who visit those areas as they did during the age of exploration are far more prone to skin cancers, uh, something that my own uh, late and sainted legal father, the man who raised and guided me, Chief Petty Officer George Joseph Dietrich of the United States Navy, contracted uh, squamous cell cancer, which is a basal carcinoma, a skin cancer uh, that was so aggressive, the most aggressive case the medical establishment had ever seen uh, in the uh, military uh, to the point where when they operated on him, they had to remove uh, part of his skull to prevent it from getting into his brain. Uh, He survived that and ultimately the deformity caused by his Surgery disappeared. I'm happy to say all of this happened. And uh, but the reason why he suffered what he did was because he's white and he's out of an environment uh, different from what white people evolved to exist in, which is the northern climes, which where there is far less sunlight. And hence, you evolve a whiter skin to absorb more vitamin D from the sun that you otherwise could not absorb if you were of a darker skin color. But so however, you, don't, don't we have different gods here? Don't we have Odin in the Nordic areas? Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll, we'll, we'll go into that uh, later organically. Uh, it's uh, something that evolved. Certainly the, uh, the Nordic and Celtic peoples had their own gods, their own cosmologies, their own religions. Much of this, of course, became subsumed and um, uh, for a long period of time, thousands of years suppressed by the rise of Christian uh, identity, the rise of the church, uh, which also led to the decline of magic, which was very much a part of those cosmologies. So we have to uh, understand that the re-emergence of any white identity would uh, ultimately involve uh, paganism, uh, heathenism, as it was known by the Christians. Uh, of course, a person can say, I'm a heathen, meaning they're a pagan, proudly. Uh, in other words, they will own that term in the same sense that, say, for instance, uh, uh, the gay community owns the term queer or rehabilitates it, uh, it, takes it on as their own. So many people in the pagan community have done so with the word heathen or heathendom. So um, in, in yeah. and heathen. Sorry, back to Liebensborn. So a lot of people would say that Liebensborn had died out with the Nazis. Well, I'll, I'll get back to that. This is important. Uh, the important point that I need to make so that people understand this 
uh, because it's a understand that you grow up in a matrix of propaganda. You're indoctrinated and most people have no comprehension of just who is saying what and where certain ideologies are evolving from certain, say, uh, objectives. So when it comes to uh, Jack London, who was a uh, committed ideological communist uh, to the point of extremity that he's comparable to the Khmer Rouge in Kampuchea, formerly Cambodia, we're talking about somebody who took upon himself to live a life of squalor. There is in Oakland, right across the bay from myself, a little shack that is preserved in the open that Jack London literally used to live in. And it's about the size of a child's dollhouse, like a very large dollhouse that child children will play in in the front yard. It's about the size of that. It's not even you couldn't even call it a a dwelling by any human standards. It's it's a hovel, a shack. Uh, this is preserved because of his literary leg legacy, which most people are only not even aware of. His legacy advocated the annihilation of th all the Asian peoples on Earth. Uh, the uh, uh, annihilation of entire races so that the white man could ultimately inhabit their lands. Now, this is important uh, to Europeans because it gives a context here. This is the ideology of communism. The ideology of communism is racist and built on white supremacy, which was advocated by Karl Marx. Simply, Karl Marx's philosophy was later heavily mutated by uh, Friedrich Engels. Engels was uh, like the apostle Paul to Jesus Christ. Most of what people are following instead of Christianity, or rather the teachings of Christ, what they're following, following instead is Paulism. Uh, yeah, Paul took the ideas of Christ and subdued them or sublimated them within his own ideology creating more of an ideology than a religion, then that became the faith of the church, which is much more based on the Apostle Paul than it is on the teachings of Christ, which was more followed more directly by the Gnostics. So it is with uh, Marxism is entirely subsumed in the under the ideology of Anglesianism or Engelsism, uh, the ideology of Frederick Engels, who t forged the Marx myth uh, and did for him what Paul did for Christ, which was uphold his name while perverting all his teachings. So all of that needs to be emphasized because that brings us to Liebensborn as the part of Nazism no one ever speaks about. They speak about the genocide incessantly, which was really the ideology of communism supported by Americans, Americans like Jack London and Frederick and uh, the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So when it comes to the uh, side of life that, and I do use that term pointedly, the side of life that the Nazis represented, uh, Heinrich Himmler set in motion a breeding program to basically reinforce biologically the boundaries of Europe. Now, Europe, of course, is an idea. The very super peninsula that comprises what we identify as Europe is a peninsular entity. It is a subcontinent, not a continent. People refer to it as the continent surely out of surely out of respect for the impact it's had on the world. There was no concept of Europe at the time of the Viking are the Celts. The closest concept that was forged in terms of a European identity was by the church, so that by the time of the Middle Ages, you had the concept of Christendom, which was the closest concept you had to a European identity. Europe is the faith. That's what it was at that time. Uh, later on, they began to forge a European identity based on the stabilization of the tribes, and by this I mean white tribes, European tribes, into nation states, which evolved long after the forging of the faith across the subcontinent, the super peninsula that is known as Europe. 
So people understand that term geographically, super peninsula, because it's profoundly important. Europe is a peninsula of peninsulas. The Scandinavian peninsula in the north, which has the northern Mediterranean Sea of the Baltic, and the Mediterranean Sea, where you have three peninsulas, the Italian, the Balkan, and the Iberian. And these are respective, very reflective of the super peninsulas of Asia that uh, Iberia is reflected in the super peninsula in Asia of Arabia Felix, the Arabian Peninsula. Italy is very parallel to the Asian Indian subcontinent in Asia, and the Balkans are very parallel to the peninsula in Asia of Indochina, uh, leading into the Indo-Asiatic archipelago, just as the Balkans lead into the Greek islands, which number in so many hundreds. All of this is important to the evolution of the Europeans as a miniature reflection of Asia, and they are essentially the intellectual outgrowth of the vast Asian subconsciousness. So the intellectual Europeans became a guiding light of rational materialism after they emerged from the years of faith into an enlightenment known as the Renaissance, spurred, of course, by Marco Polo's contact with Asia. This is essentially the geographic bicameral mind beginning to emerge and work. But in order to maintain that identity, Heinrich Himmler understood that the Europeans had to maintain an appearance of looking European. This is one of the things that uh, is what will preserve a cultural identity is appearance. So the project Liebensborn was initiated so that they could uh, basically make certain, first of all, that women would not needlessly abort their race out of existence, as was advocated ultimately by the communists. To put this into some perspective, Dr. Wilhelm Reich, who was an ardent anti-Nazi, Dr. Wilhelm Reich was affiliated with the communists. And Dr. Wilhelm Reich, who gave us the concept of Orgon, the concept of a life force in that was interpreted by him in an accessible manner for Westerners, that was the equivalent of what the Chinese call Qi, as in Qigong, uh, the Japanese call Ki, as in Aikido, that's simply life force, breath, literally breath, what the Egyptians called Ka. Um, this life force that was analyzed by Wilhelm Reich in a scientific manner was called Orgon. And of course, one of the things he remembered as a profound experience in the days before World War II was the fact that a young Nazi uh, maiden, one of the Hitler youth, uh, of the Female League, uh, visited, visited him secretly for an abortion. And when she did so, he asked, um, why do you come to myself, a communist doctor, for an abortion? She said, I understand the communists are better at performing abortions. This is true. This is why the Russian woman, because they're given safe, legal, state-sponsored abortion, and they're living in an environment where no one in their right mind would ever want to bring a child into, uh, not simply because of the moral reason of the hellishness of the environment. In, that includes under Vladimir Putin as, as much as it was under the Soviet Union, uh, but it's, it's simply too much for a parent to afford. Nobody can afford to raise a child in Russia. So because of this, the average Russian woman has experienced between four to eight abortions. That means the average wo Russian woman at, demographically, statistically averages out at six abortions. So the, the, the... You should say that because I got in a lot of trouble as, and it's all over the net, the actress Sienna Miller. I was asked by The Sun to um, ring an abortion clinic um, that she had had an abortion. Now she's blonde hair, blue eyes. And they said it was Jude Law, the actor Jude Law's baby. 
Now, I became distressed and upset because that's an Aryan baby. And so I put on the invoice, Sienna Miller pregnancy check. I didn't want to use the word abortion. And I got in trouble. It's all over the internet. But I rang her GP and I said, but I was only asked to check an abortion. And they said, well, why didn't you put that down then? I said, because I was distressed over it was a, an Aryan baby. I couldn't, you know, and they can't understand that and think I'm lying. But it did. It triggered something in me. As well, it should, uh, because it represents the death of an ethnos. It represents the uh, death of a race. Uh, the it, the Westerners are profoundly uh, warped. They, uh, for instance, are so warped in their perspectives that they consistently will, the pundits, the uh, uh, talking heads, will talk about, oh, well, you know, Japan's dying out. Uh, Japan's, you know, there's, there's nobody having babies proportionately or demographically. Uh, the Japanese are in the opposite uh, situation of the Russians. Their standard of living is the highest in the world. Uh, there's only one other place on earth that's even parallel would be my Taiwan in which I was born. Uh, their standard of living is so high, they no one has feels the need to have children. The children are simply considered an invasion into uh, an otherwise placid uh, life that is uh, uh, essentially one where they're fulfilled and have no need for any children to feel full to add or 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 imbue them with any sense of fulfillment. So well, what well, they're managing. We're programmed here. All the BBC dramas are the white woman has a black man, got to be a black yes. man. And then women my age or women um, who are married and with their man, oh, you're depressed, you're upset, you must go and have sex with a black man. That is how you'll fulfill yourself. It's definitely an on-running theme. <laughs> it's, an, yeah. it's definitely an on-running theme. But why, uh, why, why are they so threatened? I mean, we're not even allowed to use the word Aryan here. When I was talking to a journalist, Michael Gillard, recently, about the Sienna Miller thing. He said, why were you so upset about her aborting her baby? And, and I went, oh, it was, it was, and I couldn't say it. And I thought, you know, and I spoke to my son after and he said, yeah, you can't say that. You can't say, oh, it was an abortion of an area. You could, he'll think you're a Nazi. And it's like, I mean, we're not allowed to say Aryan anymore here. Yes, no, it, it is. This is just so people understand this academically. Academically, the term that they have replaced it with is Indo-European, which is incredibly stupid. It's 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 just a it's just this fallacious term. And uh, what they're saying is the exact same thing. <laughs> just so people understand uh, what the term Indo-European means, because people have this warped idea that oh, it must imply like indigenous like indigenous European. That's not what it means at all. It means ultimately the source point is from northern India. This is what the term Aryan means. The very term Aryan is an Asian Indian term. It is applied to the warrior caste, the warrior caste that conquered Asian India. Uh, the majority of India uh, geographically is black. Just so people understand this, the southern half of India, Dravidian, the Dravidian peoples are black. Uh, northern India, where which was where the capital was established in New Delhi, this were these were white people that conquered the entire Asian Indian subcontinent. They were known. The very term Aryan means uh, ethno warrior. Simply applies race sure. warrior or a warrior who preserves the race. So when the Aryans established themselves, then they were such a powerful empire, um, a dynamo, that there was a migration north towards Europe and a maritime migration that ultimately helped to colonize the island archipelagos of Japan. This is why the Nazis understood that the Japanese were Aryan relations. Oh, Okay. I have. Oh, OK. It's glitching on the other side of the Atlantic. All we can do is hopefully wait it out. Yeah, you're OK now. Should we okay. go back to the Nazis and, and, and Lebensborn just in case we, 
you know, just in yeah, case cut we. Off. Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> so, so understand that, um, as I was saying about the Aryans, this connection between the migrations of the Aryan peoples led to uh, the maritime migration to the Japanese home islands, the northerly migration across uh, into uh, the continent of Europe. Uh, the very term the Greeks used to refer to one of their major Silk Road stopping points or uh, a subsidiary uh, ethno uh, states was Iran, which is simply the Greek word for Aryan. Uh, that's all Iran means is Aryan. The very name means Aryan. The, the Shah of Iran used to uh, reference himself as the emperor of the Aryans. So this, re this term has been uh, vilified in the West, and then they use the term Indo-European in its stead. Now, in order to maintain the Aryan population base, Heinrich Himmler launched the Lebensborn breeding program, which would, uh, the objective was essentially to equal the population of Germans on the subcontinent of Europe. So understand that when it comes to the uh, European continent, uh, the Germanic diaspora and the Germanic tribes impacted genetically pretty much everyone in Europe. Uh, pretty much every ethnos in Europe is, it, not all of them, but the majority are in one way or another genetically impacted by the Germanic peoples. This is why Adolf Hitler, uh, one of the reasons why he had such a soft spot for the British, why he spared the British armies when he could have massacred them at Dunkirk, uh, which was, of course, propagandized as this great escape. There was no great escape. Adolf Hitler allowed the British to go home in the hopes that this would be a uh, selling point for peace, that the British would negotiate. Uh, of course, none of that happened under Churchill, who, like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was a Freemason, and the Masons are the blood enemies of the Bavarian Illuminati, who were the foundation of the SS, which was carrying out the Liebensborn program. Uh, now, of course, this adds to further confusion from people because they think of the SS in the Latin letter sense, two S's, and they say, does that stand for super soldier or super soldieri? Uh, no, um, though the spirit of it certainly carries uh, in the more uh, literal sense than uh, uh, what you find in many people who say they're super soldiers who are victims of an MK Ultra program. And what they really mean to say is that they're super victims uh, here in the West. And I'll tell people where that term evolves from in terms of the aftermath of the American Civil War. But um, in Europe, the SS stood for Schutzstaffel. These are two lightning bolts that are runic of the runic alphabet, and uh, they're nowhere near the meaning of the Latin letters SS. They so, are- So where did, um, obviously when I was born, the war was, you know, long gone. Um, are you saying that the Catholic Church took over the Lebensborn pro program? Only in the sense that they were exploiting products thereof. So let's put it this way, when it comes to the, uh, uh, the SS, important to finish the thought there, and I'll bring it back to the train of thought that we're maintaining overall that ultimately explains your origins, your own origins, your personal origins. Uh, understand that the SS, what it really stands for is Schutzstaffel, which uh, the two runic symbols uh, signify in the old language, uh, the occult victory meaning that there is victory even if the victory is secret, occulted. Occult simply means that which is occulted or secret, uh, that which is rendered not visible to the open eye. So the when it's Latinized, the letters are Latinized, then they're simply Schutzstaffel in the sense of secret service. This is right. what the trace is. Are you, are you saying that because I was... Uh, at Velversburg, then I was probably in the SS? Well, it, the definitely, I want people to understand this. This is uh, something that then involves the concept of reincarnation, which many people think is 
this is oh that's this is basically they think of it then as voluntary uh in terms of a belief system do i choose to believe in reincarnation do i choose to believe that uh there are past lives that i can indulge myself with okay to put this into some perspective for people so that they uh understand the uh gravity of the situation this is not something you have a choice to believe in it is simply part of the natural cycle of human life which there is a soul your psyche that's what the soul is called in the ancient greek uh and uh it is a complicated unit of many parts there are those that either ascend or descend to higher or lower levels of vibration it has a higher or lower density that can be perceived in the Christian sense as heavens and hells. And there is that element that reincarnates. So both of these elements are real because the soul is essentially at least a trinary unit. Trinary in the sense of the, the Trinity. Um, we are created in the image of God. God is viewed by the church uh, in reflection of ancient wisdom the wisdom that existed before the church as Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, meaning a uh, triune entity. Now Christians can view this as the creator, the Christ figure, the son thereof, and of course this Holy Ghost, which most people don't understand because it gets too vague for them. But uh, there are elements of the soul that stay. In other words, maintain themselves on this plane, we can perceive them as ghosts or that which essentially uh, remains with the body, which is why Christians felt it was so necessary to bury the body whole and not incinerate it. Uh, there is that element that if there is no body could essentially maintain itself by uh, a place that was important in the life of the experiencer. Uh, hence the identification of ghosts with uh, uh, a fixed geographic spot. Uh, this can also be a kind of recorded memory that simply is imbued into the area by tremendous trauma. Uh, that being said, uh, the incarnation of uh, the soul results in our memories from these other lives. Now, Heinrich Himmler was very much uh, initiated into these secrets, a member of the Vril Society and the Bavarian Illuminati. And as a result, he understood uh, quite well that there is reincarnation. And uh, when he was asked about the annihilation of so many Jewish people, he was thinking of the Lebensborn program in which they were trying to produce more Aryans and being quite aware of the phenomenon of incarnation and reincarnation, he said, many of these Jews being murdered now will reincarnate as Nordic Aryans. Now, all of this may sound ridiculous and beneath respect for the average person who is raised in this Western perspective of devastating ignorance. But the reality is there have been books written on the fact that many uh, people who are blonde haired, blue eyed, uh, have memories of dying uh, in concentration camps, death camps, or, uh, or being murdered during the Holocaust. And uh, they'll say, gee, I have memories of this, this Jewish experience in a past life. And uh, well, it just goes to show that what Heinrich Himmler said was quite true. Now, this is explanatory. Uh, what people might become confused by is why is it that so many people have experiences on both sides of the equation. Uh, for instance, uh, Christine Joanne Alhart has basically incarnate memories of a past life as a victim. Uh, she remembers Treblinka, which was the only death camp. And again, there is a need here to disambiguate the death camps from the concentration camps. Uh, Konsitzlagen means concentration camp. Uh, which is a labor camp. 
Uh, did people die in those camps? Yes, some of them worked to death. And uh, some of them uh, died of uh, the diseases that became rampant and endemic with crowding. Uh, but then there are the death camps, Totenslagen. And this is where people were essentially, uh, well, they were there to die. <laughs> they were brought there to be exterminated. Um, now, when it comes to uh, Treblinka, Treblinka was one of those death camps. It was meant specifically to kill everybody there. And it was the only death camp that experienced a mutiny, a rebellion. Uh, in that case, the Jewish people who had collaborated with the Nazis in sending other Jews to their death, uh, sending them to the gas chambers, incinerating the bodies, uh, and then uh, they, in turn, were uh, ultimately doomed to die. Uh, they chose to do what they were doing so they could live the longest. Uh, towards the end, when it came their time, they decided to rebel, having nothing to lose. Now, there is no portrayal of this in film, even though there is a film by that name, Treblinka, that in any way, shape, or form has anything to do with the reality of history because there's no way you can make these Jews very sympathetic characters. <laughs> these are people who killed their own by the thousands and so they could live longer and then decided to rebel when it was their time up. Uh, these are not sympathetic characters. Nevertheless, when they did rebel, uh, they failed ultimately, but they died fighting. That was something that perhaps you could portray in a film with some degree of sympathy, but it's never been done. Uh, the end result is that this is a memory that Christine Joanna Hart uh, recalls. She recalls involvement with Treblinka. When it comes to the involvement with the SS, understand that there are many people who have memories of simultaneous past lives. Again, this is why the soul is a complicated unit. It's as complicated as your human body. So your human body is complicated because unless you're a clone, <laughs> you are a product of two different people with completely different genetic histories. Unless, of course, there's heavy incest involved. <laughs> so unless you're a product of a marriage between brother and sister, first cousins, or the like, you're going to have people with very different genetic histories whose biology combines to make you as a unique unit. Now, there's all kinds of things that go wrong. And there are people who are born hermaphroditic, uh, far more than people know. So very, just so people understand it, most of us are born, a, born, we're born a boy or a girl. Uh, there are plenty of people who are not. Nobody knows this because the medical industrial complex has hidden it completely. Uh, this is because when such children are born, they simply take that baby, put it before the parents and say, what do you want, a boy or a girl? Because it will obvious, obviously to the parent have both a penis and a vagina. And at that point, the parent uh, just decides what they want, and the medical industrial complex just butchers the baby, uh, turns them into something without consultation with the infant. By the way, just so people understand this as a very short little tangent here, those people should never have that happen. What needs to happen is that parental couple that had that child needs to go into counseling and that child needs to be allowed to develop until their legal age, 18 at least, and between 18 and 21 decide whether they want to be a boy or a girl because what the medical industrial complex does is it fucks people up completely and creates bearded ladies and men with high effeminate voices like Mike Tyson's. And uh, these people are fucked for life. It's like, this is why many people are perceived to be gay or lesbian. And in reality, they were born with different body parts and were surgically mutilated. 
and they were simply meant to be men, but never formed as such, or women, and they're attracted to the opposite sex in their own eyes, but everybody thinks they're attracted to the same sex. This is a lot of it is a result of medical mutilation, just so people understand. Oh. And this is going, so going back to the super soldiers. I've only got about another half hour um, because I'm sitting in a position. Um, yeah, c c can we just go? Go back so, to the Nazi involvement in super soldiers. And so understand what that what Heinrich Himmler like... wanted, yeah, to to um, to basically cement European identity, he wanted to make certain that Europeans stood out, and therefore he offered women the state care of their babies. This is where the abortion problem comes in. Uh, abortions were just beginning to really be available legally and safely. And uh, what was going on was the Europeans were, because of the uh, hard times, m many people were aborting their babies. And Heinrich Himmler saw this as a terrible waste. And so what he said was, we need the state to support these women by giving them places to live until their babies are carried to term. So Liebensborn allowed women to carry their babies to term in a state-sponsored facility where they were fed, cared for, and the child would ultimately be uh, a child of the state if they did not want to keep and raise the child. So Liebensborn was a state-sponsored orphan rearing program, but the child's identity was to be a child of the state. And uh, these children who were raised, one of the most famous, was the blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, lead singer of the band ABBA, the Swiss band that became world famous. And uh, she lives, of course, in seclusion because of her constant life of death threats by people who want to kill her as a product of Liebensborn. Now, so the very... Going back, to, going back to my case, it was um, the church. Obviously, you know, I, I was born a long time yes, after that. this is... This is, this is what happens with um, the very term occult victory. So the SS uh, understood, uh, people need to understand it existed hundreds of years before the Third Reich in the form of the Bavarian Illuminati, which was created as by Adam Weishaupt to struggle against the Freemasons who were new world based had established themselves in the New World as their empire, and the Bavarian Illuminati was established simultaneously to protect Europe from their espionage. Now, the Freemasons were dedicated to the annihilation of the church. The Bavarian Illuminati were created by Adam Weishaupt as the perfectibilists, as they called themselves, to balance ultimately the concept of a European specifically Germanic identity, separate from the church, while also preventing the Freemasonic infiltration of the church. The idea was to struggle against the Americans across the Atlantic and ultimately help to preserve the church, which was a foundation of European identity, while creating a new European racial identity. This is why, as I said before, the Wehrmacht or the conventional armed forces of Germany fought for the fatherland, whereas uh, the concept of the nation state, whereas the SS fought for the race. Their units were racial units. Uh, they contain units of other nationalities and races that were segregated, each one defending their own race in a united front against those that want to breed all races out of existence, which is the Freemasonic ideal. So understand that the Freemasons want a world of coffee-colored consumers. The Bavarian Illuminati are struggling to preserve the identity of the races and cultures. And this is the diversity of the SS, which had units from all races fighting on the side of that cause. Yeah. So, so going back to the Crusader rescue, obviously they're Catholic run, no Nazis around. So why? why they helped the Nazis escape in the exodus after the war. The Nazi connection with the Vatican was profound. It's important. 
Important to remember, Adolf Hitler was born a Roman Catholic. He never disavowed his religion. Uh, the um, when the SS was formed, much of its military uh, formulation was based upon the Jesuits. The Adolf Hitler once referred to Heinrich Himmler as my Ignatius, as uh, Ignatius Loyola had founded the Jesuit order. Um, and of course, this meant that they were warrior monks. They were warrior monks, but for a pagan cause to Europeanize the, uh, the identity of the subcontinent of Europe. And their objective through Lebensborn was to make certain that by 1980, 1984, by the mid 1980s, there would be 180 million Nordic Aryans. This was based on the fact that prior to World War II, the Germanic diaspora throughout Europe, including the Volga Germans that had been invited into Russia by Katharina de Gross, Catherine the Great, uh, these all of these Germans spread all over Eastern Europe and other parts of Europe, uh, numbered 180 million Herren Volk of Volksdeutsch, Germanic uh, European peoples, but they wanted to create an equal number of Nordic Aryans to truly Europeanize Europe in a much more physically distinct form so that there would be a homogenous European identity more similar to the kind of homogenous identity that helps the Japanese and the Chinese prosper. One can prosper when one has a united sense of identity based upon appearance because you look at people around you and I, you immediately identify with them. That's the importance. So obviously, of obviously, obviously Europe now isn't like that. I mean, I will go to the shops today and feel left out because everybody there will be Indian that's, or Pakistani. So that's quite right. But the secret victory was the aside from many of the Nazis escaping into Unterland, the the lands below different subject. We'll go into that another episode, another interview, the secret victory consisted of the fact that while the Vatican was among the major parties helping many of the Nazis escape, many of the Nazis maintain a uh, lifeline into areas where they maintained uh, more purely Aryan colonies. The surface world maintained some elements of the Lebensborn breeding program, and that was co-opted by the Vatican. The Vatican and its church then began to use nunneries to basically take products of this program, blonde haired, blue eyed, Nordic Aryan babies like yourself, and the church, instead of honoring its pact to provide them with any lives of substance, or at least a good start in life, instead sold them off to Western intelligence agencies. So you were exploited by the MI6, the British Intelligence Agency, mercilessly. Uh, you were marked from when you were young by identifying you with a serial killer, and then you were exploited to bring down the Irish Republican Army, or a large contingent thereof, at least its uh, uh, infrastructural establishment, uh, to uh, destroy a lot of its uh, viability. Uh, and uh, this was the allied way of trying to use Nazi assets against them in the sense that you were used to reinforce a destructive cause, the allied cause of the ultimate annihilation of the white race. This is something that uh, uh, they find ironic uh, is to use a white person as an asset by which to bring about the destruction of the white ethnos which was the ultimate intent of the founding fathers of America, the Freemasons. So this was the real reason for the war between Germany and America. One of the primary propagandists, and we need to emphasize this right now, was Robert Anton Wilson, who took his middle name, Anton, from the founder of the First Church of Satan, the Jewish magus, Anton Zandor Lave, who he considered his magical father. Robert Anton Wilson propagandized relentlessly against the Bavarian Illuminati and therefore 
this is how most Westerners understand the Bavarian Illuminati is this force of evil in the world that represents the new world order when it's really the Freemasons who founded their own American empire. This is the back ass words or ass backwards perspective of the West. This is how fucked most white supremacists are and why their white supremacy is so destructive and so self-defeating. Also because it's uh, intertwined with the patriarchy of the church in terms of attitude to create a male supremacy. You were exploited by a patriarchy. You were exploited by a patriarchy that not only exploited you sexually, used you as an agent of seduction. They not only used you as a sex asset, but condemned you for it. And then present you as a slut, a whore, a kind of prostitute. And this is how they actively exploit you while destroying your reputation and your life. This is something that could never have happened uh, had the Reich persisted on the surface world. And uh, this is why you were so abused all your life because you were identified as a product of the Nazis uh, well after they were reestablished in the subsurface, the subterranean world. And you were one of the abandoned, the lost, those who are a product of a program that operates in secret, but in a sense is supported by its connections to the church. When people think about the church helping the Nazis escape, so many of them, the so-called rat lines, no one asks why or what did the church get out of it? Did they think it was simply some sense of uh, humanitarian cause that the Vatican would help the Nazis escape? Or did they think that there was some payment involved? Now, the church is no pauper organization. It's not an organization of the poor. It's not like they needed money. What they got was a tithe of children. Certain bleed off elements of the Liebensborn program were maintained on the surface world because everyone in the adoption industry wants to adopt a white baby, demographically, statistically. And uh, so it was maintained to provide a steady flow of white babies. And- uh, Right, but that, I, I, my, my mother, um, she's got dark brown eyes and dark brown hair and the father who she told me it was Apparently it's in the files, even though I can't read her file. I was just shown what she had said. He's got dark brown eyes. And, and I met him. I didn't meet her. I met him. I looked at him and thought, no, you're not my father. I knew somehow. Well, you, you know, I'm sure you know intuitively that neither of them is your mother or father. That these are not your parents that they told you are your biological parents for one thing physically uh neither one of them looks anything like you oh so who 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 is then i don't know who is exactly but i can tell you who is in the general sense the strategic sense the project liebensborn paying their tithe to the church for helping the nazis escape and relocate so, to so what do they get jars of um, or something it's you're 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 not a you're not a test tube baby and you're not a clone you're a product of union uh between people but you were simply uh taken by a covert program that will never expose liebensborn because liebensborn is a secret organization on the surface world what's maintained are breeding farms of a sort these were what you were a product of was the hippie era what they used to do is set up hostels for hippies and a lot of these europeans who had nothing to do with nazism no idea about nazism yugoslavs for instance you know yugoslavia was one of the uh uh largest powers on the continent of europe the three largest armies on the continent of Europe during the Cold War were the Warsaw Pact of the Soviet Union, 
the NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and Yugoslavia, this independent communist nation under Josip Broz Tito. And uh, what they did was a lot of their students, like students all over Europe, they would go on a year sabbatical, you know, a year to find themselves, travel the world. A lot of them camping out in hostels all over Europe, having sex with each other. These were actually subsidiary facilities of the Lebensborn program. Many of these hippie women who felt they didn't want an abortion were provided an opportunity to live in there and then turn their babies over, sheltered, fed, and then ultimately the child was given, sold, if you will, to the church in exchange for that escape years ago. This was to go on for a period of several generations. Yours was of that hippie generation where two blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, Nordic uh, Europeans got together in one of these hippie hostels and uh, you were born into the world and they were forever stricken from the record. They weren't even entered into any records. There is no record. Oh. Then a record okay, was created. And then what happens with, I've heard the super soldier stuff, they shatter you and then they take one part of you and attach a demon or something. And then that part is the part that's triggered. Is that true? It is. <laughs> but there's other elements to it historically. The super soldier program started in the United States in 1876, 100 years after the foundation of America by the Freemasons. What happened was the American Civil War had taken place and uh, then uh, the South, in a very real sense, won the war. They won the war by uh, basically when they held the legal votes after the war was over as to who was going to be president. The man who was supposed to be the 19th president of the United States after the Civil War was Samuel Tilden, a Democrat, which in those days meant you were a Dixiecrat. It meant you were a Confederate. The Confederacy won the election. Samuel Tilden won by a landslide. But the Union, which thought itself as thought of itself as winning the war, could not abide by that. I mean, to win the war, quote unquote, and then lose the peace. They had to set up a deal because the Southerners arose in arms and were marching on Washington again. And the Union couldn't stand a reinstigation of hostilities. So they made a deal and they said, OK, we are put our Union man in this uh, gorilla in a suit that was a former general of the Union Army. And he'll be president, but we'll we'll remove our occupation forces from the South and we'll leave you to govern yourselves under the Klan. That's what instigated Jim Crow laws where the Klan effectively suppressed the blacks, unlike what the Union wanted, which was for the blacks to overrun the whites and breed them out of existence. The Union was defeated. So they retreated in defeat, but they had their puppet president installed. And at that point in history in 1876, a pirate flag was run up over both the Union, the United and Confederal states. At that point in history, elections ceased to have any meaning. So with that, they developed the super soldier program because they said, how do we keep this secret? How do we keep the politicians from leaking what we just did? Well, the U.S. Army, the Union, decided to uh, create a cadre of young boys. And these boys were sex toys. And they could basically have sex with these politicians, be trained to kill them if the politician threatened to talk. There's nothing more scandalous for an American family who was established in those days than for the man to be found dead in what's apparently a suicide's lovers a lover's suicide with a young man that would destroy the reputation of the entire family from running for office and these were dynasties these were people like the kennedys who put generation after generation in office this is all they do that's their that's their dynastic career it's like the nobles in england the equivalent thereof so these super soldiers were young men trained to sleep with them compromise them threatened to expose them if they would talk 
ultimately keep them all under control. If need be, kill the son of a bitch. And uh, uh, a boy can do that. A girl does not have the upper arm strength to, with her bare hands, choke a man to death at all. She doesn't have that upper arm strength. A boy does. So they're programmed to act on a moment's notice. This is the training Max Spears and James Casbolt both went through. You, on the other hand, you used your body in a different way to destroy people. And in fact, they trained you to be turned on by serial killers. So that you would be essentially subject to other super soldiers who are basically serial killers. So this is your origins, your this is the context in which you were raised is do things make a bit more sense now? They involved Michael Aquino, of course. Michael Aquino was the man who victimized you. Uh, he was very impish, mischievous in how he had people remember him. He had himself because he believed himself or truly was Scottish nobility and descent. He ultimately retired for a period of time in Scotland where he even purchased a Scottish castle that he claimed was his birthright through descent. He understood the concept of the Celtic puka. The puka, for people who want to get just an idea of a puka, the invisible rabbit companion, take a look at Jimmy Stewart's movie, Harvey. Jimmy Stewart had an invisible friend named Harvey, a massive invisible bunny rabbit that was always his companion. Want to take a look at a more serious version of that? Johnny Darko. Oh, and when I it still, comes to- I still don't, I still don't, um, I still don't quite understand the serial killer thing. So how do they make you sexually attracted to a serial killer? This has to do with the child uh, rape you went through that you may not even consciously remember. Now, Michael Aquino, I believe, if I remember correctly, brought up your name once to me before I even knew you as one of the children he had raped at the nunnery, where he was invited in to do just that. Understand that the Roman Catholic Church has certain elements that are deeply involved with intelligence agencies to fight against the overarching threat of atheistic communism at that time. And therefore, they basically sold you to an intelligence agency. Because you were a product of the Nazi Liebensborn program, the nuns considered you damned at birth. They considered you impossible to save, that you would never be redeemable. Because of that, you're a product of the demons as far as they're concerned. They gave you over to the CIA in uh, the case of uh, the intelligence agency involved with you specifically. It was the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the military intelligence branch of the United States, where Michael Aquino took advantage of you. You were among many hundreds of children that he raped, but you were one of them. This was the beginning of your trauma, your traumatic breakdown, your primal trauma. Michael Aquino was your primal trauma. That's why he's the bunny rabbit, the rabbit, the puka, that's invisibly your companion for life, your trauma, your scar. And that was the beginning of getting you turned on to serial killers. That and your mother's beatings, you kind of live the life of a serial killer. But women don't become serial killers. They are too genetically different to have that that kind of shall we say proclivity and as a result you become attracted to them instead does so that make on. sense um hang on what what you said i lived the life of a serial killer because my mother's beating do you mean that's how they're formed yes you had that kind of childhood a parallel childhood in that sense you could relate to them, empathize. And that's how uh, you become able to communicate with them on a deeper level than 
a normal person could. Uh, the you were traumatized in uh, layers. So. Unlike, say, for instance, extreme examples. You don't have. Scores of personalities like Sybil with 26, 27 different identities fractured. In that you're fortunate. If they did that to you, you wouldn't be functional as the kind of human torpedo you functioned as when they uh, turned you to destruct the IRA. You had to get involved with Campbell and you ultimately bore his son, which is one of the primary reasons that the IRA never chose to kill you after he was locked up in a concrete hole the rest of his life. Your son acts as kind of like um, your they spare you because they figured you the son needed a mother. Campbell's son needed a mother. So what happened with so when I was with him, why did he see I was two different people? What did he see? You talking about Campbell? Yeah. Campbell saw that in you and he that's the most that I can say. He had an intuition in terms of uh, that aspect of you because uh, in a sense uh, that's what you are. He probably sensed the fact that you were a combination of two past incarnations. Understand what I said about the human body. You're a product of two different physical people. Your soul is a product of two different souls. From one of them, you got that experience with the Jewish side of the Holocaust. From the other, you got the experience of the SS side of the Holocaust. The reason why? Well, one of your parents was involved with the Nazis one of your biological parents, one of your real parents, and was involved with Liebensborn. Could have been running the facility, like, say, like a hostel manager. Then the hippie chick comes in, he has sex with her, keeps her around till she delivers the baby. And then uh, she says, I don't want to be strung down by this baby. And he says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And then you wind up with the nuns. What about if they used my 13 year old so-called mother, the dark eyed one? Mm -hmm. What if they used her as like a, a sort of a, a breeding machine? I just don't think it's likely that she had sex with loads of Irish road menders. Might they have used her? Because she said a priest was involved right from the start. That it could all be true, but it has nothing to do with your birth. Right. Yeah, all of that is probably true, but has nothing to do with you. Uh, right. You're a product of Liebensborn. We're considered the enemy to be exploited. And uh, uh, the end result has been uh, you, your life has been very much. You're a war orphan, honey. You're a war orphan. That's what you are. Who, who was who was my enemy? Who was the church? Your enemy is the allies. The church is different. The church is like a third party. The church is basically neutral. The church is, give you an example. When uh, the um, Pizarro, Pizarro was the conquistador who conquered Peru, the Incas, and uh, en route to the new world, there was a mutiny. Essentially, uh, many of the men wanted to turn back and return to Europe. Uh, Pizarro made certain they stayed on path to conquer the new world. Uh, for whatever reason, the captain's daughter was on the ship. He forced the priest to marry them. He himself to the captain's daughter where when he took over the ship so that they wouldn't return to Europe. They would go on to conquer the Incas. When the captain, who was not killed, otherwise the daughter would never have married uh, Pizarro, but he was bound, and he was bound and forced to witness the wedding, and he demanded of the priest, why do you allow this? Why would you marry my daughter to this man? And the priest said, the church always sides with the strongest. So understand the church exists for itself. 
it's but, that's how and, it lasted. And who, who are the who are the allies? The the Freemasons and the Americans, yeah. Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt were both Freemasons. So it's important to understand the Freemasons are the enemy. They are the allies. They are the people who promote communism. And the racism which demands the annihilation of other races rather than preserving cultural and ethnic purity. In fact, they want to destroy the white race by breeding it out of existence. That is the enemy. The Freemasons of the Anglo-American establishment. So the important thing to recognize is that this is what the Reich was fighting against among so much else that the this evil the allies represent. So right. and how, how, do they, how do they do the actual if um, Campbell saw the um, that part of me, the Joanna part, I call her Joanna. Um, and I do now, thinking back, recognize having a, a weak part and a stronger part. For instance, I would go to his house and find myself in obviously a no-go area for the English. And yes. I would feel like honestly so much terror and fear. And I would think, what am I doing here? And yes, OK, I was a journalist, but journalists don't need to do that. You know, I mean, none of them have done that. Um, so I got a lot of attention because of my stories and anyone listening to this, I know there's a so super soldier guy who said, oh, you've never met the real IRA. I, I've literally got stories with my name on for the News of the World and the Sunday Times. There's proof concrete out there that how close I got. And the other editors and journalists, the Belfast based ones. Well, like, how did you get so close to them? How did you get? And one woman said it to me and I said, why don't you just dye your hair and pad your bra out? And I know that was out of order of me because at times when I was down there and it is a no-go area across McGlenn, South Armagh, I felt this absolute terror. But when I swapped into Joanna, I didn't feel the fear. But as me, I felt the fear. So how do they manage to create that and why Joanna, did it glitch? yeah that, yeah it's well through what i've explained it's there's a fragmenting of your personality that's necessary because you have to compartmentalize your behavior when you're acting as a spy you're an actor or an actress uh believe me i have one altar this was something that was created uh because i was volunteering to fight communism uh, by becoming a field agent uh, to infiltrate United Vietnam. When Vietnam united under force of the communists, it became the third largest communist nation on earth. It was the third largest in terms of population after first communist China had the most people on earth, was the largest communist nation on earth. The second largest was the Soviet Union and the third largest was Vietnam. And uh, so at that time, after the Vietnam War, it was decided to create a artificial personality for me that could be uh, basically a separate persona that would uh, overtake myself to infiltrate Vietnam, uh, a half Vietnamese Amerasian, uh, a product of America and Asia genetically, uh, who was a former Kit Carson scout, as they used to call them meaning someone who had defected from the communists and began to serve the Americans. Uh, this meant that they created a personality that was 10 years older biologically than I am. Uh, and uh, that uh, dossier created for my other self that speaks fluent Vietnamese, uh, that's locked away inside of me thanks to the Vietnamese doctor who served as my psychiatrist, Dr. Tao Tran, herself terribly disfigured by napalm. Uh, from the Vietnam War. She uh, basically uh, created a artificial memory that was compartmentalized. And therefore, if I were ever to be captured and brought in for interrogation, no matter how hard they would torture me, I wouldn't give away any secrets because at that point, that personality would suppress itself behind a wall. And what would emerge would be myself, 10 years younger, uh, the Douglas Dietrich that you know you have this other persona 
that was created to brave the frontier, the demilitarized zone of Northern Ireland and uh, that uh, suppresses yourself. Uh, the Christine Joanna Hart we know. So what comes out is Joanna instead of Christine at times when she's needed or the right trigger word, the right code phrase uh, is applied. Uh, the person who would have the keys to that would be someone like Michael Aquino, whoever your handlers were. The person who probably didn't have it was Miles Johnston. He was acting as your handler in a much more brutal sense. He was simply exploiting you and humiliating you and um, trying to discredit you through, uh, as he did Max Spears and everyone who worked with him. He works with hammers. Someone like Aquino would work with scalpels. So you so were handled. How, how, how did they, so they cre I don't understand how they, create it? How do they create the Joanna side? How does that work exactly? Well, as I explained with myself, it's simply something that's uh, really a series of cascade memories. And uh, at some point, someone worked with you with hypnosis. You would never remember the sessions uh, because you were involuntary. I volunteered as a field agent. I was never sent behind the lines, behind enemy lines in Vietnam. Uh, so my need for this altar became redundant. Ultimately, the psychiatrist that created this altar in me helped suppress it. You, on the other hand, are working much more differently. You didn't have that option. You were working involuntarily by people who, at some period of time, uh, inserted Joanna within you and never bothered to erase Joanna. You suppress Joanna through uh, strength of will combined with the fact that the environment doesn't call for her to be needed. Uh, she served her purpose in bringing down Campbell and uh, so, large. So where is, is Joanna part of me or an inserted? Is it me? In the end, it's up to you. It's up to you whether you integrate Joanna or not. That's your struggle. My, the only thing I can do is help you realize that reality. Once you realize that reality, you take it from there. I think probably the best option would be to render Joanna a part of yourself and integrate her and Yes, but I, I, I don't, excuse me, I don't have access to it, which is quite annoying to me because obviously I work really hard um, when I was working. And so for me now, looking for work is someone that actually hasn't really done anything. So it's kind of feels weird, you know, it feels as if there's a whole part been taken because I don't have access to it. Do you know how to get access to Paul? Let's put it this way. Um, my psychiatrist made certain that my Vietnamese altar or Amerasian, half Vietnamese, half American altar is half, half Vietnamese. It was actually Eurasian. I am Amerasian. My father was an American sailor. My mother uh, was half Japanese, half Chinese. Uh, the Vietnamese altar was actually half European, half French. So Eurasian as opposed, Euroasian, Euroasian as opposed to Amerasian. A pure Eurasian would mean someone like a Russian. Euroasian means somebody who's con subcontinentally European, but, you know, married some Asian woman or produced a child by such. So my Euroasian altar was completely suppressed by my Vietnamese psychiatrist so that he doesn't interfere with my life. So in a sense, uh, Joanna being suppressed is probably best for you. Um, if she were emergent, then I would say the healthiest thing to do is to integrate her. But if she's not emergent, it's probably for the best that she is not. Well, and, no, I don't, I don't like that. I want it to come out. I don't like a whole strong part of me not being there. I feel like a car, somebody's taking the engine out. That's not I, really I understand that. I understand that because unlike myself, your altar, Joanna, was active. 
she was indeed activated. And that means that her experiences are effectively in your body. You're deprived of her experiences. And oh. in that sense, you're incomplete. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does feel but, like that. Yeah. But the best that I can recommend is that unless you, I'll tell you this, it's probably for the best she remain repressed. And uh, since she's not emergent, then uh, then I would say that what you probably need to do is understand that part of you that's suppressed in the sense that the context that I've provided and then work with that the way that a person would work with a missing limb or missing both legs. I mean, it sucks that you have to adapt to living life in a wheelchair or yeah, I really don't want to do that. I mean, there must be a way to to access it. Why did you say it's for the best? Well, I say I, I try to think in terms of the positive. <laughs> so I if you have that, a situation that yeah. is, say, for instance, hard to correct, then you try to make the most of it. So I'm trying to see it in the positive that, you know, if she's suppressed, maybe that's for the best. Uh, yeah, because it's, 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 it's not for the best. I, I want that part back. Because, as you said, I was busy doing things. And so that grew me through her as a person. I yeah. want that back. That's me. That's part of me. All my time with the press. And I don't know how much Murdoch is involved. I seem to be a bit of a fool guy for Murdoch. He's, so let's put it this way. Rupert Murdoch is one of the most evil men on earth. Just to explain this to our viewers, our listeners, I want everyone to understand this. Rupert Murdoch is pure raw evil. He is someone who effectively is the dictator of Australia. For those of you who do not know this, um, Australia, I say this for the benefit of our reviewers, our listeners, uh, Australia has had multiple electoral governments. Those governments rose and fell uh, as puppet assets of the one man who's run Australia all this time, the Murdoch, in charge of the Murdoch mass media machine. Uh, when they have done analyses of the most controlled state-run media environments on earth, the ones at the top of the list are communist China and Australia. Communist China has a state-run mass media monopoly. Australia comes in second best. <laughs> and Murdoch runs Australia. He makes or breaks the elected puppet politicians. Whoever well, gets elected. I, I, sorry, I, I was high up in his um, media world, as you know, the News of the World and then the Sunday Times, which I yes. can prove again. You know, I've got plenty of um, clips, clippings with my name on. I work with Mazen Mahmoud, the fake sheikh as well. He was a bishop in, in that. Um, it was very Masonic, the whole um News of the world, the way it was run, need to know basis. Most of the journalists were kept on the don't know anything level. Mazza was kind of high. One of the news ed editors that I knew, Greg Miskew, he was kept on the lower levels. Um, the whole thing with the phone hacking, that was a MI6 setup to shut that down, you know, what it was involved with. And when I was out in South Armagh, I was um, working for the News of the World and then headhunted for the Sunday Times, both for his newspapers. And I sometimes feel like when people are telling the story now, there's a guy called Graham Johnson who keeps making sure my story is told in a, like I'm, I'm dismissed. He keeps making me dismissed in the story. So my story has never got out there. I did a hell of a lot of work for Murdoch. Um, and when a guy called Nick Davies came to me from The Guardian to tell the story of Murdoch, um, yada, yada, he said to me, will you go on the record? Now, if I'd have let myself be filmed by them at that point, I wouldn't now have Graham Johnson writing me out of history, which he does with great alacrity. And I know there's something with him linked to the occult. I don't know what it is, but when I speak to him, you can tell he's listening on a different level. and. Um, with, with the Murdoch thing, Nick Davies asked me, go on the record. I thought, I, I kind of sensed that maybe I'd be written out of things. So I thought, well, I'll seize my opportunity. I'm not going to be left out here. I'm the one who brought phone hacking 
fucking into the fucking news of the world. Nobody even mentions my name or the MI6 linked guy who um, brought it in. They just got a dummy there in place. So the story isn't told. And it's even been told again now. But this Nick Davis guy is getting his version out, which is total horseshit. Anyway, I said to him, I will be filmed by The Guardian. I went home that night and I had a dream. And in the dream, there were loads of white rabbits. And this is the first white rabbit dream. I didn't have any knowledge of that. I had no link to the truth movement. I didn't know the sim symbolism. Anyway, there were so many white rabbits everywhere. I started to walk on their dead bodies. Then there were giant sized white rabbits and they were chopped up. And then there was just rabbits everywhere. And I, I thought to myself, this is an occult attack. So I turned around and I said to the bunny rabbits, who are you? Why are you after me? And they answered in unison, we are Rupert Murdoch's army. And I woke up and I was sweating. My heart was like rapid like that. Nick Davis rang me really early, said, right, we've got the studio set up for you. I said, fuck off. I'm not going to do it. And he said, might I ask why? Because yesterday you agreed to go on record against Murdoch. I said, bunny fucking rabbit nightmare and hung up on him. He must have thought I was fucking crazy. But I think now that was me being controlled, clearly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I want you to understand something else, the importance of the symbolism. Uh, Australia is overrun by a plague of rabbits. In fact, the rabbits are so they come in waves that are powerful enough to knock people down off their feet. They are they overrun entire parts of Australia. The Australians have done their best to uh, eradicate them to the point of deploying biological agents, including germs and disease. Uh, for the rabbits to catch the plague and die. Um, nothing has been able to kill off their rabbit infestation. Uh, it's an invasive species, not natural to Australia, that has decimated the environment. Uh, they're the only culture in the world. This is the year of the rabbit, by the way. Uh, in Vietnam, it's the year of the cat. So it's the year of cat and rabbit. But all over Asia, it's the year of the rabbit, other than in Vietnam. And uh, the when it comes to the rabbits in Australia, the Australians are the only culture in the world that views rabbits as an instrument of terror, as a as a manifestation of horror. They actually created a horror film in Australia uh, by the name Night of the Lepus, in which giant rabbits were uh, carnivorous, overrunning towns, eating populations. Night of the Lepus actually exists. This is an Australian film. Just so people understand the horror of the rabbit as experienced by Christine Joanna Hart, in its occult manifestation uh, imbued in her by Michael Aquino using the Celtic concept of the puka, uh, which you see. This it, was to not grass up Murdoch. So Murdoch yeah. must be and, and, and Murdoch is a Aquino cultist. They are, they are co-religionists. So it's important to emphasize the fact that they're all working together in this in your life. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, as I said, this profoundly evil man, th this is one of the reasons why uh, Australian men are the hardest in the world to get along with. Uh, your average Australian woman can't relate to your Australian man any more than back in the 80s uh, or 90s. Your average black American woman could never relate to your average black American male who was a misogynist on a on a dick trip. Uh, so when it comes to the uh, Australian men, they're all programmed in the majority by Rupert Murdoch. Uh, the, their alternative right uh, radicalized uh, uh, Russophiliacs, meaning that uh, these are essentially people on the side of Putin. Uh, these are all the product of the Murdoch media machine. And he's obviously uh, been a malevolent factor in your life. So uh, you certainly have been controlled by him, uh, among other elements. Uh, in a sense, they leased you out, the intelligence agencies. Uh, and he, being one of the powers that be, one of the allies, uh, in the actual sense of an established figure in their power structure, uh, utilized you while discrediting you. That was the entire uh, strategy of... Uh, that idiot who worked with bases, Miles Johnston, uh, and uh, that that criminal uh, helped in the murder of uh, Max Spears and uh, 
uh, again, to emphasize the importance of this so people understand that Max Spears snuff film, the visual footage has been hidden because that would implicate truly uh, render the guilt uh, by all evidence uh, indefensible on the part of his murderers. So they only play the audio that's still loose on the Internet, as far as I understand, probably available on YouTube. But one of Max Spears' last words was to consult Douglas Dietrich for help, telling people that uh, Douglas Dietrich is the only one who knows how to contend with Michael Aquino. Uh, ask Douglas Dietrich, just so, so people what, know. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What, what about the, the tall whites? Now, I know the Nazis dealt with them. Um, what, what was your experience with them? Well, I had the experience with Sarah. Sarah um, sent them into everybody's minds um, in the group. And also she did it recently at a big conference, the Awakening Conference in Los Angeles. She sent the tall whites then into everybody's mind. No, and apparently there was about 50 people and about 30 of them experienced the tall whites come into their minds. So what's going on with them? Is there a link now to the super soldier? Well, she's a super soldier too, right? Well, how do the tall whites appear to you? When they come into your mind, are they appearing as Nordic area? Yeah, 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 he did. And and I asked Sarah after, I did an interview um, over on my YouTube and said, um, which ET was that? He appeared, and she said tall whites, he appeared like tall and long white hair and old and he had jewel, jewel green eyes and he told me I was from Alderburn, Alderburn. Um and she's been doing realm walking with us like she would take us off to Saturn she would take us off to other realms and mm -hmm. then we talked to oracles on those other realms and it's actually been helping my psychic powers really because now I was doing some realm walking with another girl in the group and I managed to see through the past into um, Russia and I encountered Rasputin, which mm. um, was interesting. So my, my personal powers have been growing um, since, since, since that experience. So what's going on there, do you think? Well, to set the record straight so people understand this uh, as briefly as possible, uh, I want people to understand that uh, uh, Max Spears, uh, one of the last loves of his life was Sarah Rachel Adams, who helped uh, keep him off drugs that would otherwise have killed him. Uh, he began to feel she was suffocating him. Uh, he broke off into a virtual relationship, which he maintained towards the end of his life with Crystal River and Crystal River. Well, I think uh, with, because remember, he told me just yeah. a few days before he died, he said he was madly in love with, with Sarah. He, he, he said that, and uh, he, he was. He was also madly in love with Crystal River. <laughs> so I just want people to know that Max Spears was a man who, uh, he, he, he had a virtual relationship with Crystal River. He was never physically intimate with her. But for some reason, Sarah Rachel Adams uh, was trying to gain total control of the narrative and kind of erase Crystal River out of it, which was, uh, which was, let's just put it this way. He was saying that towards the end of his life because he probably realized at that point it was over and he was going to die and uh, just wanted her to know that. Uh, because uh, he, he had been separated from her for months, at least. And during that period of time, he was she emotional. Was, I, I believe that she was going... No, I know this for a fact. Um, Taj told me she was going out with Sean Stone. Max had a fit of rage over it. Um, he definitely still in love with you, told me. He was tearful. But she had finished it, you see. And then he got angry and did a succession of posts about... Sean Stone. Um, all of this is true. All of this is true. It's just yeah. I'm I just bringing up another aspect. Oh, yeah, of it. yeah, One, yeah. Back to the back yeah. to the tall whites because we haven't yeah. got that. Yeah, back more. back to the tall whites. I do want to emphasize that uh, Sarah Rachel Adams's involvement is a question mark to me. Uh, that's the one reason I I wanted to bring this other aspect of it out because she is definitely hostile to me. 
Uh, I have no personal hostility toward her, but she's hostile to me because of I the think Crystal something River. Something you said about Haley, I'm not sure what it was. Oh yes, well, may, the one thing I could say is that Haley was involved with James Casbolt, and their divorce involves his revenge pornography. Oh, yeah. Everything else that you know, all all that we can go into another time. The tall Did whites. You maybe do, say you had sex with her. Did you say you had sex with her at one point? Well, let's just put it this way. I I don't think we should go into that right now, <laughs> but I will say this much. Uh, I'm not the, uh, the it's it's she's she's uh she's uh she's definitely was a victim of Casbolt's cruelty and uh I I I tried to comfort her in in any way that I could. Uh when it came to uh the situation with the tall whites now what's important here is this uh you have a situation that is parallel to many people who are a product of Liebensborn. Uh now what's going on with you may be something that Sarah Rachel Adams might uh be taking credit for, but it's something that probably would have happened anyway. At some point, because you are a product of Liebensborn, uh the the Unterlanders, this is the Thousand Year Reich in exile, the Nazis in exile, the subsequent generations that have grown up beneath the surface of the earth in massive caverns. These are relatively close to the surface in that they're under the crust, but integral to the crust of the earth. They're not deep, deep down towards any hollow earth. It's not a hollow earth. <laughs> there are within hollows within the crust of the earth. And within these caverns, the breakaway civilization has prospered. The Unterland to which the Nazis escaped to through Antarctica primarily. And uh, they do harvest the eggs or the genes of products of Liebensborn on the surface world, like yourself. They have to do this in order to maintain an immunity to the diseases that are rampant on the surface world. Uh, otherwise, any exploration they do of the surface world. Uh, will result in their bringing home diseases that could annihilate their entire race or communities that would have to be quarantined off in their caverns. So they uh, definitely, you have probably experienced whether Sarah Rachel Adams has anything to do with it or not. This is the reason I went into that tangent because it's important to contextualize Sarah Rachel Adams. Whether she's got anything to do with that or not, they would have come to harvest from you. So you'd be seeing them anyway. And uh, the thing that I want you to understand okay, is- hang, hang on a sec. Yeah. Um, well, Sarah, when she did a womb cleansing on me, um, <laughs> as it was coming out of me, I did start seeing um, that I'd been used for, for harvest. I didn't realize that till then I was one of those before. Um, but anyway, going back to, are you saying the tall whites and the Nazis are one and the same? Yes, these are the descendants of the original Nazis that relocated and resettled. Why have they got, why have they got superpowers then? Because this is what they were breeding towards. It's breeding towards an evolution of humanity to the point where they're evolved far beyond the people on the surface world in terms of being able to take advantage of innate abilities that people on the surface world have, but are discouraged from developing. So uh, in the Unterland, they have developed their real powers, their telekinesis, various uh, telepathic powers. Uh, and uh, so to a degree, when they communicate with you, it's telepathically. Uh, and what they will tell you is that when they say you're from Alderbaran, um, they tell everybody they encounter they're from Alderbaran to uh, basically divert the attention away from Unterland. In your case, they're telling you you're from Alderbaran. What they're really telling you is you're a product of Project Liebensborn, that you're one of them in terms of your origins, meaning that you're not an Unterlander, but you're a product of the Third Reich. And uh, therefore, um, your real uh, sense of identity, loyalty should lie with them. That's what they're telling you. And uh, um, the uh, the reason that I brought up what I did about Sarah was not to like indulge in some form of self-explanatory 
shall we say, pastime or something like that. It's to put into context why her involvement with this is is unusual. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's she is definitely uh, a product of allied uh, super soldier slave breeding. She is a asset of the allies. Uh, she would be probing uh, to find out who's connected to the enemy. It asked the Nordic Aryans, the intra-terrestrials, the intra-terrestrials of Unterland, who are portrayed by themselves and the allies as extraterrestrials because they have space travel and they do travel to the moon and other parts of our solar system, at least perhaps even to other stars. Uh, the technology as a breakaway civilization is far advanced. This was because during the time of the Third Reich, uh, while it was extant on the surface world, uh, Subramanian Chandrasekhar was an Asian Indian physicist of great brilliance who isolated the mathematics of black holes, which the Germans knew to be the Schwarzenzon, the black sun, at the center of every galaxy that keeps the galaxies intact by gravity that results in the Hockenkreuz or the hooked cross, the swastika spiral of the galaxies themselves. This recognition of that fact, the Nazis welcoming his physics as Aryan physics, as opposed to the British, who just dismissed what he had to say, under Sir Arthur Eddington, who just basically said he's this yellow nigger, whereas I've got my big toe, my big TOE, my theory of everything, listen to me, that led the Allies backwards half a hundred years, while the Germans advanced by half a hundred years in terms of their physics. So the Germans are at the point of potentially interstellar travel at this point in history. Certainly within the solar system, they uh, can travel uh, quite freely, whereas the Allies have never gotten anywhere. Uh, so they dominate both under the Earth and uh, in space for the present moment. And uh, what they will use as the deceptive point is the Alderbaran uh, mystique. So uh, Sarah Rachel Adams, who uh, is someone who um, has uh, basically desired total control of the narrative resulting Max Spears, and, and this is just where she's coming from, uh, she decided to vilify myself, and therefore I do have to qualify whenever I speak of her the context. And it does involve Haley Mayer, so we can go into that more deeply another time. That's it's too involved to go into that right now. Oh, uh, I'm not a nosy person, so I oh, mean, oh no, 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 no. I, I, I believe me, I, I'm open about it. I'm open about it. I'm not. I'm not afraid to talk about well, it. I was it's just, just right now. I want to concentrate on you. Yeah. Cross. Yeah. So so uh, to concentrate. Yeah. To um, back to back to the tall white. So I managed to see through a portal the past, which I know is not a normal power that other people have. Is that because of the residual powers of Joanna, or have I got them now, or am I growing because the tall whites want me to grow? Your Liebensborn heritage. Were they were, Henry Himmler was not just breeding people to create a aesthetic, while that was important, uh, homogenous identity is important, but he was breeding people towards the development of their innate abilities from the latent Superman to that of realizing the potential of the Superman. You are, in a sense, the child of the Superman project, in that sense, a true super soldier in the more literal sense, and you're developing some of your superpowers. This, these were inherent in you through the genes of whichever psychic hippie chick or dude was uh, basically having sex at that hostel that was essentially maintained, financed by the Lebensborn. And uh, that's how you were born with these so, powers. So should I psychically try to connect Connect with the beings in the Underland? Should I try and connect to them since they're apparently my people? I would say it wouldn't hurt. I would say, why not? It, uh, 
it doesn't matter if you don't get any results. It wouldn't hurt to try, but you would probably find a greater sense of inner peace that way is what I would suspect. It makes sense, right? Well, they could give me back Joanna, I'm guessing. I, I don't know. I don't know if they would want to. Maybe that would be, uh, as I said, I understand your desire to, it's like a person with missing limbs. Obviously a person who's missing their limbs would want their limbs back. So I can't oh. fault you for what you want. What I'm saying is the result may be more than you can handle. <laughs> what would happen if a person, it? yeah. It's what, sorry, just, why is that? Why? Why, because, well, uh, it's, what if I suddenly were, let me put it this way. Say, for instance, uh, when I uh, applied for SSTI, the judge uh, ruled in my favor on conditions that I never drive again because he knew that I had far greater potential for road rage. He allowed me to keep my firearms because statistically firearms kill far less people than automobiles. He felt that I was too dangerous to let loose on the road of my own under my own accord because I would probably commit a road rage crime at some point and be responsible for potentially many more deaths than I could cause by a firearm, as could be evidenced by people who crash their cars into crowds. So he, he made me swear never to drive again. Now, my say my Vietnamese altar came back into activation <laughs> and I were say he would drive a car. He would have no qualms about it. And uh, then I would have broken my oath to the judge that I made under that influence. That's something like that might happen to you where your altar comes in and you would do something you personally would never want to do uh, with your altar activated. It's uh, these altars, after all, are powerful. They 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 truly take over. It's it would be nice to think we could integrate them, which if your altar were appearing fairly regularly, breaking through, then you would have no choice. I would say, okay, let's work on integrating this altar, but your altar is not doing that. So you, that means your altar probably- Sometimes it, it, it actually, okay. no, it sometimes, sometimes yeah. it does. Sometimes- She sometimes does, she does. does. She. So, so, so let's respect that. Okay. And if that's the case, then meditate in terms of contact with your people and see if they can help you integrate this altar. It can't hurt to try. That's a start. We can go further in different episodes. Does that make sense? <laughs> in other interviews, okay, we can. And, and my people are these tall whites. These these tall. Yes. Hang on. If they why don't they just take over the earth? Why do they let this place? Why would they want to? <laughs> That's like, come on. Look at the condition of the surface world. Do you think they want really? a part of this? Yeah, it's really bad. What about that Rasputin character? Is he of any relevance to me? Uh, probably he's of some significance or you wouldn't have. Uh, uh, let's put it this way. The um, in terms of uh, what we expressed with the fall of the uh, Russian Tsardom, uh, the monarchy, uh, this was, of course, uh, the Bolsheviks uh, uh, opportunity to uh, take over Russia and the, the damage that's been done ever since has been catastrophic uh, to the point where it's going to result in the uh, practical annihilation of the Russian people. Look at where they're at now under Vladimir Putin, who's simply an agent of the KGB. That's just the con continuity of Bolshevism. Uh, the Russians are going nowhere fast and in a race to the bottom uh, and they'll beat everyone else to the bottom uh, in terms of their decline in population. Uh, they're, they're equivalent to the Native Americans in the sense of their, their population becoming peripheral as opposed to uh, their delusion of being oh, any sort of great power, let alone world power. So when it comes to Rasputin, Rasputin was part of that milieu, that vortex, he was 
not on the side of the communists, which in a sense renders him uh, a sort of uh, positive figure, but he was also very much a figure of chaos, an agent of chaos. He was the, well, the foundation for the philosophy of Alexander Dugin, who is known, introduced uh, uh, proudly by men like Alex Jones as Putin's brain, whom all the apologists for the Russians continually try to say has no power, yet this is a man whose textbook on geopolitics is the textbook in the Russian military academy. This is a man who obviously has profound influence over both Putin and the former Zalviets, the, the Russian high command. So he is kind of uh, building upon the legacy of Rasputin, only truly going to the darkest depths with it. Uh, Rasputin compared to him would be almost a uh, benevolent figure, but it's kind of like comparing uh, the Magus Anton Zandor LaVey to Michael Aquino. Uh, just because Michael Aquino may be orders of magnitude more evil doesn't make Anton Zandor LaVey any kind of angel. So understand that Rasputin was a really bad guy, but he was his own man. Uh, people like Rasputin are committed to the true darkness, uh, the forces of chaos beyond any sense of uh, personal volition. They're no longer even in, in control of their lives. So Rasputin represents potency, a powerful figure. Uh, he's a figure that is uh, uh, not to be emulated, but certainly not surprising to me. There would be a connection through uh, Russian royalty uh, to many people, including yourself, ultimately. Um, so whether that's by bloodline, through Rasputin or Tsar Nicholas or, uh, or, or the bloodline of someone affiliated to them, uh, I would uh, dare say that uh, uh, if he's of any significance, uh, uh, find out what you can. It's, it's one of these things where if you resonate with him, uh, at least it's a figure who's not as damning as many others. <laughs> so are, are I, the Russian are the are the Russian people linked with the Aryans? Because I think didn't we all come from the Russian steppe originally? All of the tribes of Europe were impacted by the Germanic peoples. The uh, these the Russians are simply the product of the Vikings. The Vikings, who instead of raiding the seas and plundering peninsular Europe, those Vikings who went riverine, basically the Vikings, you have to understand, were a pirate empire. The Vikings were like a pirate empire on steroids. <laughs> and the Vikings were basically Nordic Aryan, and those that raided the seas, plundering uh, peninsular Europe, impacted it profoundly, those that went inland and became river pirates, river Vikings, settled into the Volga and the Russian steppe thereby, those were the descendants, the founders of the Russians. The Russians are simply Nordic Aryan by descent from the Vikings in the north. Uh, in the end, the whites, which is the whole point of what I was saying at the beginning in terms of uh, how the white race is spiraling, uh, understand that the whites at the time of World War I, at the height of the Victorian Empire, were basically, con when you include the Slavic peoples, who are obviously blonde-haired and blue-eyed in many cases, and you take a look at uh, the various Nordic people in Canada, or America, the, which was a majority white nation, at the time of World War I, the white peoples were 50% of the world's population. Half of the world's population was white. They could never have conquered the world otherwise. And for all intents and purposes, it was a white world by colonization. By the end of the Second World War, because of the Freemasonry of Roosevelt and Churchill, the white race had disintegrated to the point where 
by the time of the end of the Cold War, through the mass slaughter of each other, where you had 60,000 white Britons die in a single day on the fields of France in World War I, running into German machine gun fire, where you had World War II and these subsequent Holocaust of the German peoples. Uh, by the end of the Cold War, whites were around 15% of the world's population. This is from 50% no, I to 50 I can understand sorry. why, being that they're white themselves, they're not black, why they would want the annihilation of the white race. The Freemasons are seeking the destruction of everything. They are seeking ultimately the destruction of the world. They seek the destruction of anything that uh, is constructive in the world. They are ultimately self-destructive because they feel this will give them the power of God. Understand that the founding fathers who were all Freemasons, Freemasonry is a religion. It's the religion of deism. For those who don't understand, to be a deist means that you understand the reality of God, that God created our world, our universe, but you believe in a clockwork universe, a mechanistic work universe, that the God created the mechanism of the universe and then abandoned it. He is a God gone away in the minds of the deist. To a deist, God has given us an empty throne. And if they can destroy all the clockworks of God, they can occupy that throne. They feel that they can become God, ascend to the divinity. There were statues of Washington that are hidden in the Capitol that portray just this as well as paintings in which George Washington was to take the place of God. So understand that the Freemasons believe that by destroying the works of God, then they will take his place, that uh, he is dead and gone, abandoned our universe. It's an empty vacuum. Power abhors a vacuum, and they aim to fill that vacuum. They feel that one of the ways to do this is by a form of self-destruction, a form of destruction which uh of that which is divine and uh because they understood themselves to be white they feel the white race is divine uh truly closer in the image of god and therefore must be destroyed that's their madness this is what are they jews are they jews or not they are not they are uh whereas the zionist element of this would be the edomic elements but they are Edomites. They are Edomite in the sense of uniting with those negative Zionist elements, the Herodian elements, which are ethnically not Jewish at all. But Herod was placed in charge of Israel by the Roman Empire. He was an Edomite. He was ethnically not Jewish at all, but he was running Israel, placed there in power by the Romans, and ultimately uh, took over the religion. Uh, the modern Israelis uh, are basically aligned with Herod. They feel he is the most important figure in their history. Uh, this is someone who's not even ethnically Jewish. And the reason why is he left them uh, whatever architectural sites are that Israel has that any tourist could visit is Herodian. So what this is, is a Herodian insurgency. It is Edomite. And the Masons, who even though not ethnically Jewish, the Freemasons are Edomite, Herodian. So this Herodian insurgency that they represent is that negative, uh, dark Zionism that is Cthuloid in its nature that I began to go into in uh, uh, our other interview. I can go into that again in another interview following tonight's and uh, explore that a bit more. These are the forces that brought down the czarist monarchy. These are the forces that gave rise to Bolshevism and Roosevelt socialism, uh, Churchillian, uh, the Churchillian state. Uh, this is the enemy. Uh, and of course, take a look at the populations of the big three. Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin, the men who wouldn't allow the Chinese leader, Chiang Kai-shek, to even sit near them when he was in their company. He was left out of all of the photographs, even though he was physically present. That's because he was no Edomite. 
no servant of the anti-gods, but the big three. Take a look at their works. Look at the condition of Russia and England and America today. Russia and England and America today are hell holes, cesspits. You can't recognize them as cultures that are even identifiable. They are anti-cultures. They're anti-cultures whose uh, sense of political correctness. I, I remember, oh God, the, the scandal whose name I've I've I finally bleached from my mind because of the the crap that I had to take when I brought it up. Uh, there was a little town near right between Scotland and England where it turned out the, basically the entire female population uh, was open to rape by a bunch of Pakistani and uh, other South Asian migrants who just came in to rape all the white girls. And uh, they basically allowed uh, uh, these girls to be just trafficked uh, where they could be taken off the streets or out of bus stops and gang raped. And when they would bring their sperm stained clothes to the police department, the police would simply burn the evidence, uh, take their clothes and put them in the incinerator. This was going on for generations. And uh, when I was trying to bring up this topic, I'm attacked by Scots who say, oh, you're talking about an English town. And the English would attack me saying, oh, you're talking about a Scottish town. I don't give a shit which side of the border it's on. It shows that both of those cultures should be ashamed and disgraced for allowing this to happen. And how does this happen? Because in England, a uh, South Asian with a turban can do no wrong. Because it would be yeah, politically true. correct to say they could. And yeah, look at where you're at now. You've got a prime minister educated at Stanford right here in California. And this Stanford graduate, Rishi Sunak, this house nigger in a suit, is proud of the fact that half a thousand Britons die every week because there's no ambulance response. You can call an ambulance in England and... Well, you might as well not call him because nothing's going to show up. And Rishi Sunak says, the weak must perish. This is Stanford economics. I mean, how come this guy isn't taken out and burned alive like they did Guy Fox? Uh, this is beyond absurd. The fact that England tolerates this grinning monkey in a suit bragging about the economic efficacy of half a thousand Britons dying every day because they don't need to pay for a National Health Service ambulance response and the fact that the British don't violently revolt shows you what Churchill brought you to. This is Churchillianism, the ultimate result. They're experiencing the equivalent thereof in Russia from Stalin's legacy and we experience the equivalent of here from the legacy of Roosevelt. This is what the allies have wrought upon you. The Axis were the good guys fighting against this. And we speak of the madness of political correctness. Think about when, uh, well, we just recently had Purim. Purim was the Jewish festival of Lutz. Meaning, basically, uh, in the time of the king of Persia, who may have been uh, the original Xerxes, uh, at that time, uh, it was decided that uh, Mordecai, uh, exposing to him that the uh, Jews would not bow, were disloyal. He said, let them be exterminated in a single day. Kill them all, men, women, and children. And we will draw lots upon this. Uh, then he wound up marrying a Jewish woman, Esther, that very day, apparently. And uh, that, along with his being convinced that uh, the Jews were essentially running the finances of his empire, uh, he was convinced to instead kill Mordecai and his ten loyal sons. This was considered such a great victory for the Jews that they celebrated on Purim, which, as I said, was just days ago. 
Now, when Julius Stryker was hanged at Nuremberg, he was among 10 Nazis. 10, the same number as Mordecai's children. It was supposed to be 12 in an occult ritual that was supposed to bring forth the Allied Antichrist. Bormann escaped. Goering suicided. So there were only 10 of them. Instead, that night that they were all hanged, there was delivered a blue baby born dead. An abortion, if you will, albeit a naturally occurring one or supernaturally. Then it came to life, even though the doctors declared it clinically dead. This baby's name was Michael Angelo Aquino. He was the imperfect Antichrist, the arbinger of the Allied Antichrist that was to come. On the day that he was hanged, Julius Stryker, the infamous Jew baiter of the Third Reich, the man who ran a practically pornographic Judeophobic magazine, Der Stürme, when he was hanged, he said, Pure Imfest. 1946, because this was the year 1946, they were being hanged and there were 10 of them. He was thinking of the sons of Mordecai. And so, he told, so why, why doesn't, um, with all this going on, why doesn't God step in rather than let, you know, like the English people suffer and the Russian this people is why, suffer? This is why the deists consider God to be dead. But you see, the Nazis had a much more proactive perspective. God helps those who help themselves. The people must prove themselves until the English people stand up and uh, uh, basically crucify or hang or burn Rishi Sunak alive. <laughs> until the Russians stand up and do away with Alexander Dugin's puppet, President Putin, until the Americans come into some sense of some semblance of sanity and listen to my own advisements. Uh, until then, they don't deserve to live. It, biblically, God abandons the Jews multiple times because they won't listen to him. It's the same with the white peoples of planet Earth. They did not follow Hitler's advisements. They did not follow the leadership of the Reich. And they're paying, they're paying the price for it with their anti-Nazism. Whether you're a Tory or a Laborite, a Republican or a Democrat, they all call each other Nazi. They all call each other fascist. It's whoever you don't like. It's a completely senseless word. It no longer has any meaning. All they know is that it's their enemy. It's whatever they don't like. Well, the Third Reich still exists. The Thousand Year Reich never died. It's in Unterland. And this is something these people are completely ignorant of. They have no idea there's a better world, that they are not living in the best of all possible worlds. Their insanity is, if the Nazis had won, think of how much worse it would be. Yeah, think of people like Rishi Sunak never being allowed anywhere near power, whereas now they're given total power. This is madness, self-destruction. What the Freemasons were seeking has come to pass. The only way to stop it is to stop calling each other Nazi, understand who the real enemy is. And the real enemy is not even the colored peoples who are swarming England. These are people who are simply a symptom of English madness in their still honoring Churchill as a heroic figure when he was their blood enemy. You're talking about a man who wasn't even British, but half American. A man who really wanted to convert to Islam. His sister had to talk him out of publicly doing so. And we have all the correspondence to provide the evidence of what I just said. And people say, ooh, oh, Muslims in England. Oh, well, your biggest threat was Churchill. I am appalled at the ignorance and hypocrisy of the Western world. We are left with they're getting what they deserve until what few are left rally into any sense of sensibility. Uh, this will continue. 
the neo-Nazis are not the answer because these are Russophiliacs following the orders ultimately of Alexander Dugin and the agents of chaos who brought them to this point. These are fools who are misdirected. What is needed is, of course, the ability to understand that there needs to be a cosmopolitan understanding of the world in order to preserve your own heritage and culture. So in that sense, what everyone needs to do is expand their consciousness and thereby be able to survive in a multicultural world while preserving their ethnic heritage, which is what the Nazis were trying to do. So what we need is basically not people like Viktor Orban or uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, people have to understand that uh, basically only someone like myself, the biological son of Adolf Hitler, can offer them the solution that will bring a just and lasting peace in which their culture can experience a renaissance. Uh, the reality is none of the great leaders in world history were products of their own environment. Uh, Alexander the Great, who extended the Greek Empire to the geographic uh, boundaries where they could encounter and ultimately defeat the Persian Empire, which had uh, tolerated the Jews, and created the Purim, which I referenced. Uh, the Greeks conquered them and destroyed their empire, but they did this under Alexander of Macedon, appointed title. He was not Greek, he was Macedonian. Uh, Joseph Stalin, that agent of the anti gods, was not Russian, he was Georgian. Uh, he was of the Caucasus Mountains where the term Caucasian comes from. He viewed himself as a white leader of a bunch of Asiatic Slavs that he was willing to sacrifice en masse. As for uh, Winston Churchill, he wasn't even British, he was half American. And someone who wanted to convert to Islam, his sister convinced him to do it privately instead of publicly. Adolf Hitler wasn't German, he was Austrian. Uh, Napoleon oh. Bonaparte was not French, he was Corsican, actually Italian. So you have to understand the great leaders are always foreigners to their empire. It takes a cosmopolitan perspective to take a people anywhere. Uh, the problem with these cultures right now is they're too parochial. You might say, well, the British brought in Rishi Sunak, but now you're not even speaking sanely. You're talking about a true foreigner educated at Stanford here in my own golden state of California, who's trying to apply uh, libertarian economics, which don't even work in America, where we have twice the fucking income and national, net, either national or individual, your average American is twice as rich as any Briton. Uh, you can afford to waste money here on libertarian social experiments. That kind of social engineering is bringing England to the point of total collapse. Uh, and it's costing lives every week. Uh, by the end of uh, a few years, literally tens of thousands of Britons will have died under this man's effective dictatorship. And uh, the what needs to happen is, of course, a recognition that England needs a third empire. Uh, it is now separate from Europe. It has no other solution. When the English lost the American war, when they lost the war with the American insurgency of the Freemasons, when the Freemasons, traitors to the crown, uh, defied King George because of his liberal progressive enlightenment, King George said, I declare the royal proclamation. He said the Native Americans have their own kingdoms. They are no less civilized than ours. Thus far and though farther, he said no farther, the line that he drew was the royal proclamation. The colonies will be an Atlantic maritime seaboard civilization. Uh, you don't need the hinterland. Let the French deal with the Indians. They intermarry with them and they deal with them as a civilization rather than exterminating them. The Americans said, fuck you, George, we want it all. From sea to shining sea, they wanted to conquer the heartland, exterminate the Indians. And so they rebelled against King George. This was 
if you were to follow conventional history, the longest declared war in American history, eight years, twice as long as World War II, as the Americans understand it in their ignorance. And they were the Viet Cong of their day. They fought dirty guerrilla warfare, shooting from behind the trees. When the English withdrew, they started another empire all their own. It's time for the English to do that again. Withdraw from America, start another empire all your own. Basically, the empire, well, the, the English once had the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. They ruled in condominium. All the sheikhs of the Muslim world are educated at Sandhurst. Uh, they all speak fluent royal English, the king's English, not the president's. So the English already have an empire that was established for them by Lawrence of Arabia. They simply need to ally with uh, Israel and the Arabs and create a new North African empire founded in Egypt. Uh, establish another Anglo-Egyptian Sudan in the East Mediterranean and the Levantine. Uh, and they will have at that point an endless access to oil, not to mention uh, Norway was never part of the European Union, and that's an oil power, and carry out their war against the Russians in Ukraine to victory. Russia will be the new Raj. Russia is in need of leadership. It's in need of foreign leadership because they've proven themselves incapable of ruling themselves at this point in history. Certainly for a period of time, they would appreciate a British or reorganization of their life. That is the next Raj of the third British empire would be Russia. This is the Volgans descended from the same Vikings that gave birth to Britain. That would be a reunification of the ancient Viking peoples. This is the real vision the British need to cultivate. Understand their future lies again in terms of empire, and that will save uh, their culture and, in a sense, contribute to saving the world. Oh. That's brilliant, uh, Douglas. Uh, really good. I think we should stop there because I know I'm hungry. You must be hungry. Thank you. <laughs> Shame I, I can't that. cook you dinner. You're so far away. <laughs> so thank you. That was awesome. That was great. Um, there might be bits we have to cut out, um, but should we talk about that in text? Yeah, just just oh. gonna, just go. Yeah, you know, if I'm gonna, but I think you're gonna put it on your channel, aren't you, rather than me on I, mine? I I I'll certainly shall do that. I I see nothing we really need to cut out. Honestly, if anybody has any protests, it might be Sarah Rachel Adams. But there's really nothing to protest. I mean, no, I, I don't said. think so. Mind. I think you you use the N word, and we're not allowed to use it in England. Oh, <laughs> I can okay. use it on mine though. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, That's and a, edit edit yes. that out. Understood. Out. Needs to be yeah. edited on your side of the Atlantic. Yes, yes, perhaps. That's uh, though, though it doesn't hurt to risk it. I mean, in context, you can always say you can always point out it wasn't you that said it. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I'm just yeah, because they're crushing YouTube channels now, you know. Yeah, that, that is it's an important point. So you want to be careful, uh, but you can point out uh, you, you can qualify and say, I did not say this. Uh, Douglas Dietrich is guilty of saying that uh, other than that. Um, uh, Mm, I love you dearly, and um, we'll um, hold another interview sometime soon, okay? We'll talk about this soon enough. Yes, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much, Douglas, and that was amazing. You're amazing, honey. Thank you so much for Thank all you. you do. Thank you. I'm good. I'll hang up the call for now, but yes. Good night. Good night. Have a great day. Bye for now.